So we're going to get going with our first speaker for today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Alan Wade from Vancouver Island, Canada. Um, he's asked me not to introduce him, but I am going to do something because I just can't say this is Alan from Canada which he had me do yesterday when he came to ACT Community Corrections to speak. So when the PCOA executive started planning this conference and looking for potential speakers, um, I did a lot of Googling, and one name kept on coming up, Alan Wade. So then I looked at YouTube, and I thought, okay, he's okay. He's not going <laughs> to bore us. So. As you can read in the conference program, Ellen Wade has a distinguished background publishing numerous books and articles and is widely recognized for his work in the development of response-based practice. So prior to entering private practice, Ellen worked in federal corrections, youth work, addiction services, child protection, and as a special education teacher. With his colleagues, Linda Coates and Nick Todd, Ellen developed response-based practice, which is both a method of working with victims and perpetrators of violence in their families, and provides a framework to guide professional interventions, research on social responses to interpersonal violence, and research on the connection between violence and language. Ellen teaches locally and internationally. He provides supervision and conducts workshops with criminal justice and mental health professionals from a range of agencies involved in cases of interpersonal violence. So I'm going to skip that part because you didn't want me to say that. So, um, <laughs> anyways, this is Alan. He's from Canada. <laughs> Welcome, Alan, to the 2016 PACOA Conference to Ngunnawal Country, Canberra, and Australia. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be uh, in the presence of colleagues, you know, who are really trying to uh, uh, move things forward and um, uh, you know help us all get better at addressing uh, all forms of injustice, but that particular form that of uh, that takes the form of interpersonal violence. So um, uh, I'm just going to share some ideas with you, and um, I hope they're interesting and useful. Uh, but we'll see. Um, people have a habit of napping during the pre my presentations, and uh, I don't know why that is. It's probably something to do with your family of origin. It certainly wouldn't be up to, to do to me, but uh, you're more than welcome to do that if you feel if you feel the urge. So uh, I, I, you know, text messaging that's also fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so I know everyone has busy lives. So. I'm, uh, I run with a pretty amazing crew of colleagues. Uh, as you know, um, fantastic colleagues are golden, right? Because um, ideas, you know, ethics, all of that stuff, that comes from conversations between people. It doesn't come from anybody's head, if you know what I'm saying. Ideas, practices are inherently collective in the way that they're developed. And so when I'm here talking, I'm thinking about indigenous women in northern Canada who've been supervising me for 20 years. Uh, that, that's my sort of supervision team in the back of my head. Uh, and these guys. Um, so today, um, in this presentation, I'll be talking a lot about work that uh, is Linda Coates's work and our work together. Uh, Linda is one of those uh, people with a mind like a laser beam, um, cuts through steel. <laughs> We've been uh, working together for about 25 years, 26 years now, and um, uh, it's just been a fantastic collaboration. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to stress that it's Linda's work and our work together here that I'm talking about today. What happens when you show up and do a presentation? is that people then think you invented the ideas you're talking about. So no matter how much you say that that isn't the case, people will still do that. So I just want to say um, it's important always to keep uh, citations straight because it gives everyone a trail to follow, right? Uh, and then you can do better critical analysis. And then you can track ideas down. And then you can follow them up. And then you can think, oh, oh, this person was thinking this then. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what happened then. And what does that mean for me? And that kind of inquiry, I think, is creative and interesting. Uh, made easier if we're clear about, you know, the, who's contributed what. Uh, this is a map 
Um, we call it the bubble map, because we're not very creative. Uh, but it's a map of um, what might be, we might consider important information to have in the picture when we're intervening in cases of interpersonal violence, broadly defined. And I would define violence, by the way, as any humiliation of human dignity. Uh, many people will tell you, that, you know, the bruises go away, but you never forget what he said to you. And so for many people, it's the humiliation that is the primary and deepest affront and the longest term injury, so to speak. Not to minimize physical violence, I don't mean that, but uh, humiliation. So you need to know who people are. What is their context in life world? You know, are they indigenous folks? Are they refugees? Um, were their kids born in prison? You know, um, do they identify as queer or gay? Or uh, are they, are they, do they have a vehicle? Do they have any money? Do they have jobs? Are they able to work? Uh, do they have friends? Are they socially isolated? Because an attack in a remote community in northern Canada where it takes police 45 minutes to get there, an assault in a kitchen, is not the same animal as an assault in downtown Victoria, Canada when police are there in seven minutes. Um, and so the, the local context, the geographical, the geopolitical context of that assault actually makes an immediate difference. Not, not only in a, on sort of a broader scale, but people who perpetrate violence are always anticipating uh, the possibility of certain social responses and interventions. Men isolate women to prevent social responses to the crime, the crimes they're committing. People who perpetrate violence are very aware of the actual and possible responses of other people, as are victims. So as one woman said to me, you know, every time he beat me up at home, uh, then he would want to climb on my body and have sex on me. And um, that was her phrase, sex on me. So the, for that woman, the difference between whether or not she knees him in the groin and punches him in the face and tells him to get off her and runs out of the house screaming, or whether or not she goes limp in her body to get it over with, goes elsewhere in her mind, the difference for her is not her lack of self-esteem, her family of origin, uh, whether or not um, she's unconsciously attracted to abusive guys or any of that bollocks. The difference for her is whether or not she believes that someone will help her if she runs out into the street. That's the difference. So the manner in which victims respond to and resist violence by a perpetrator is tied always to actual and possible social responses from others. If you're beaten up by your partner and you phone up your mom and, your mom's, and you say, mom, Bill beat me up and your mom says, honey, we told you he's an asshole. Like, what do you expect us to do? Now you know I'm not getting any support from my family. So my options for how I relate to, to Bill are different than if I had support from my family, aren't they? So when we're trying to understand how people commit violence uh, and how people respond to violence, we need to take into account the, oops, sorry, the actual and possible social responses of others. Okay, does that make sense to you? So this uh, is a map of an intake interview in transition houses and shelters in Canada. If uh, you look at how we interview people, um, victims, perpetrators, children, this information is in every interview, pretty much. And I can't, many of the men that I work for who've committed violence, uh, the way we begin the conversation is asking them questions about who knows. Uh, is this your first rodeo? Have you been busted before? Who knows about this? What do they say about it? Uh, how have the police, you know, what's been your experience with police and child protection folks? What about your own family and other? So we talk a lot with men about that before we get them talking about their offending behavior. Uh, because for many people, that is profoundly at issue for them. As you know, many people who have committed violence, their greatest fear is in coming to meet you is that you will see them as a non-redeemable human being. So they're very mindful of dignity, very mindful of humiliation right from the get-go. So our primary objective is to provide a dignified, focused, decisive social response to them. There are some interesting things happening in Australia, I don't need to tell you, about um, social responses, such as the Safe at Work program in WA, you know, where you can get, depending on your organization, up to 20 days paid leave per year if you're a domestic violence victim, uh, not your holidays. <coughs> Can't be used against you on the employee appraisal. I can tell you right now that will not happen in Canada in the foreseeable future. You know, it's to me a tremendously innovative uh, social response, and I, you know, I think they should be congratulated there. This framework um, is so something we've been talking about for a little while. Um, 
You know, a, a beating in a, the social setting is important. A beating in a busy nightclub where there's 200 people is not the same thing as a beating in a deserted parking lot at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a different animal. Because if you're beaten up in a nightclub and 200 people don't intervene to help you, that adds a level of betrayal and isolation that attack, an attack in a parking lot doesn't contain. And if the people, 200 people or some of those people do intervene to help you, that adds a level of dignity and safety and respect that helps you, that acts as a kind of a buffer between you and the traumatic experience because it tells you, actually people do care, actually people do help. It is okay for me to tell people what happened to me. Social responses refers to the uh, what social networks, your family and friends, uh, members and leaders of institutions, so you know, police, uh, corrections workers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. other people present during assaults, others whose actions, actions influence law and policy, and it also includes the social and material conditions in which you live. Um, if you are pretty out about being a, a person who's transi transitioning in terms of your gender identity or sexual identity, um, there's a high likelihood that in many places you're going to get a far worse response from the state if you report, report violence uh, than if you are presenting yourself as a straight male, for example, or a straight female, for example. People who are poor tend to get poorer responses from the state. And so the quality of social responses is tied to social position, geographical isolation, and a host of other factors. What I'm going to talk about uh, for the remainder of this talk this morning is more this level. Social and material conditions, and I'm essentially going to talk about culture um, and language uh, in terms of how we talk about interpersonal violence, and particularly sexualized violence, and particularly sexualized violence against children. So how we view a problem sets, sets in motion basically how we respond to the problem. We interpret problems, and then we respond to the problem according to how we interpret it. We make meaning of problems. It's inherent to the human condition. Everyone doesn't interpret interpersonal violence or domestic and family violence the same way, do they? People have many different ideas about causes and what kinds of things are in the background and what kinds of things we have to think about. But how we interpret the problem is tied to power, it's tied to culture, and it's tied to language. If you think that tuberculosis is a medical problem caused by a bacillus, then you inoculate. But if you understand that tuberculosis is higher among people living in poverty, people who with poor nutrition, people working in uh, overcrowded conditions, and people who lack housing, then you see that tuberculosis is a social justice problem, and you intervene with social justice solutions. The same thing is true of AIDS. If you see AIDS as a transmission of a, of a virus only that is possible through uh, what you might consider inappropriate forms of sexuality, then you might do sex education, for example. But uh, if you see that AIDS, uh, levels of AIDS uh, infection uh, are greatest uh, where there are forced labor camps, where people are forced to move long distances away from their families, to make a living to support their families, and that many women are taken there and prostituted and serially raped by many workers who are taken away from their families, and that produces high level of AIDS infections, then you have a problem with capitalism. You don't just have a virus. So your intervention depends on how you interpret the problem, and it's the same in terms of understanding interpersonal violence. If I get on a plane and I fly to Thailand and I rob a bank, no one will call it financial tourism, will they? But if I get on a plane and I fly to Thailand and I rape defenseless children, it gets called child sex tourism. What's up with that? Nothing to do with sex, nothing to do with tourism. That's in your law, that's in our law. That is direct collusion with perpetrators. Get it out of your law. Get it out of your public discourse. That enables and fosters violence. Car theft is not auto sharing. Bank robbery is not a financial transaction. Similarly, wife assault is not a dispute or an argument or an abusive relationship. Child rape is not sex with a child or child prostitution. So this kind of um, distinction between property crimes and crimes against people is very important. We tend to talk about property crimes more accurately than we talk about crimes against people. We tend to represent them more accurately, which is interesting, isn't it? So this goes back to the analysis by Linda Coates. Um, and the distinction between 
unilateral actions, which are actions that one person commits against another, and mutual actions, which are actions that two people achieve together. So a handshake, if I was to come and say hello to any one of you and extend my hand, and we'd make eye contact, and you'd extend your hand, and we'd have a handshake. And that would be a highly coordinated mutual action. We'd have just the right amount of high, eye contact. We, we wouldn't squeeze too hard or not hard enough. Both are a problem. When one person is ready to break off the handshake, the other person doesn't hang on for dear life, because that is another social problem. So a handshake is a highly coordinated mutual activity. Am I right? Uh, but if I was to walk up behind you when you weren't look, looking and grab your hand and start waving it around in the air, it would be wrong to call that a handshake, would it not? That would be me shaking your hand. That would be me treating you as an object. If I called it a handshake, it would imply that you were agreeing to shake my hand. So uh, boxing, a couple of guys with funny looking shorts on and uh, big old boots and mitts, they get into the ring, they start beating the crap out of each other. It's mutual because they've agreed to do it. There's rules, there's a referee, uh, and then Mike Tyson bites the ear off uh, Evander Holyfield. What has happened is they've moved from, e Mike Tyson has moved from the mutual act of boxing to the unilateral act of assault. I would not characterize that as a boxing match that got out of hand, would I? Because that would then imply that Evander Holyfield also got out of hand. For the same reason I wouldn't characterize uh, a wife assault as an argument that got out of hand, because number one, an argument cannot get out of hand, <laughs> because an argument is an abstraction. Right? And I would be then implying that both people were responsible for the violence, would I not? So I have to maintain the distinction between mutual and unilateral actions. That's absolutely fundamental to effective ethical practice. Uh, kissing, how many of you here remember uh, the first time you kissed another person? Yeah? Anybody remember that? How many of you have kissed a person in the last couple of weeks? Okay. You guys are pretty shy. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big time kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but if you remember the first time you kissed another person, you know, at, before you were so smooth at it as, uh, as you are now, you know, there's initially, especially, there's a lot of things to be worked out, right? So you, know, you have that kind of eye contact where you go, okay, it looks like we're gonna kiss. And if you're a Canadian guy, you blow it there immediately because you then start talking about it. <laughs> oh, we're gonna, and it's just like, it's like if you're on, you know, the, you're on the nice ride at the fair and you're having all kinds of fun and you're laughing and then you say, oh, look at us, we're at a nice ride in the fair and we're laughing and having fun. It's like, shut up. <laughs> so you have to do it non-verbally, which is part of the beauty of the whole activity. So you have that eye contact, you go, okay, I guess we're gonna kiss and then, you know, your faces get a little closer together, okay? You sort out the arms, <laughs> noses, glasses, okay, braces, another level of complexity. So you come together like this, and then your, you know, your mouths come together. Just let this be mouths. I know it's a poor resemblance, but your mouths come together, and now you still have something to figure out, don't you? <laughs> We're getting some local knowledge here. You have to figure out. Well, you have to figure out, what kind of a kiss is this? Is this a friendly kiss? French. A French kiss? Yes, exactly. Now we're talking. Now we're getting so. Would you like to say a bit more about that? No, I <laughs> so you're, you know, well, it, so is this a friendly kiss or is, is it a sexy kiss? So one person wants the sexy kiss. So what do they do in Australia? Yep. Kiss and not tell. Kiss and not tell. <laughs> So you're there, there you are, your lips are together, you're thinking, I want a sexy kiss, eh? what do you do? Okay, fine then. There is an international language, you might open your mouth. Does that happen here? And you might offer your tongue, which I can't really do with my hands. But, you, know. you might offer your tongue, and now the other person has a decision to make. Is this the kind of kiss I want? So suppose they keep their mouth closed, and they're like, yeah, not so much. <laughs> not so much, I don't want that. So then, now it's your job, heartbroken as you might be, it's your job to go, close your mouth, disengage, that's consent. Am I right? If the other person says no, and you got your mouth open, and you try shoving your tongue in their mouth, and slobbering all over their cheeks, <laughs> is that a kiss? What would we call that? 
you know, we call it gross, we call it an assault. But a physical description would be they force their mouth into the, their tongue into the mouth of the other person. That's a good physical description. So um, I wonder what would happen if you look at your sexualized assault cases in Australia, when one person forces their mouth onto the mouth and the body of another person, how often does that get called a kiss? If that gets called a kiss, what has happened is a unilateral act of violence has been transformed into a mutual, consensual, and erotic act. And that's actually happening on an epidemic level, internationally, as uh, I'm about to show you. So uh, if you hit someone on the head with a frying pan, you don't call it cooking. <laughs> I love that. Anonymous Canadian genius. There's only one Canadian genius, and they're anonymous. <laughs> Whoever there are, but we don't know who it is, but there's somebody. It's like Banksy, you know what I mean, the artist? But anyway, there's only one. Uh, if you hit someone on the head with a frying pan, you don't call it cooking. If you smack someone upside the head with a piece of lumber, it's not carpentry. If you smash into someone else's car with your car, it's not body work. If you attack someone on their genitals or with yours, it's not sex. It's not wrongful sex. It's not non-consensual sex. It's violence. It's that simple. However, it turns out that people who write criminal codes and write psychological and psychiatric reports and who do newspaper reports are rather confused about this, uh, which of course creates a context in which violence can be concealed and misrepresented as sex. Uh, and that happens a lot. For example, in the human debasement industry called the sex industry, or in what's called pornography, uh, or in what's called, uh, now called sex work, oddly enough, uh, the exploitive experience is called prostitution. So here's an example of uh, what happens when you portray a unilateral act as a mutual act. This is taken from a uh, materials in uh, transition houses and shelters. I haven't named them because I don't want to out them or embarrass anybody, but you know, I read all those brochures. You know the brochures you have in the doctor's offices? and all? I read that stuff. <laughs> I'm really interested in what it says. So the partner's characteristics hold them together. As abused partners adapt and become more compliant, the partner's characteristics make them increasingly dependent on one another. After prolonged abuse, they develop complementary characteristics. She's aggressive, he's aggressive, she's passive, he's demanding, she's compliant, he's blaming, she's accepting guilt. So it's like a symbiotic pair. They fit together, hand in glove, night and day, they belong, they imply one another. That's the logic, right? Have you seen this kind of thing? It comes straight out of the cycle theory of violence, 1979, battered women, Eleanor Walker. Uh, and it's an extremely powerful, influential model is taught all over the place, still used in prevention programs all over the world still. So the logic is interesting, right? It's like if you weren't so passive, he wouldn't be so aggressive. If you weren't so compliant, he wouldn't be so demanding. If you weren't so accepting of guilt, he wouldn't be so blaming. It's this logic, this is why we've been taking women who've been abused by men and putting in them, them in groups to make them more assertive and give them better boundaries for how many years? And why are we doing that? Because we assume that if a woman is assaulted by a man, there must be something the matter with her. That's nuts. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Where did we get that idea? It comes from mutualizing, right? Women aren't abused because they lack boundaries. Women are abused because men ignore them, overcome the boundaries. Women are not attracted, unconsciously attracted to abusive men. And you know who knows that better than anyone? Men who are abusive. Men who are abusive get that women are not attracted to abusive men. That's why men who are abusive, when they first meet women, they don't go up to women and go, hey, bitch, what do you say we go over to my house and smack you around, call you a few nasty names? It's going to be great. Because actually men know that women aren't attracted to abusive men. Isn't that strange? <laughs> Only mental health professionals can invent the idea that women are attracted to abusive men. It's an odd world. So the logic here is kind of like, you know what, if you weren't so black, I wouldn't be so racist. You know, if you weren't so queer, I wouldn't frickin' hate you. You know, if you weren't so disabled, I wouldn't make fun of you. If you weren't so passive, I wouldn't dominate you. That's the logic here. Uh, and I think that's the logic we've been applying to these kinds of cases internationally for a very long time. Confusing mutual and unilateral actions, changing unilateral actions into mutual ones. And then, of course, it's a slippery slope. You invariably wind up blaming the victim and benefiting the person who commits the crimes. Here's an example. Uh, Linda Coates and I were asked to do some research, and 
a territory of northern Canada, Northwest Territories, and um, they have a new Family Violence uh, Act, Protect Protection Against Family Violence Act. Very progressive legislation. If you were a person who had uh, reason to fear for your safety, you could phone in to a transition house, you'd get an advocate, and that, that advocate would explain how you might apply for an emergency protection order, and then you would be put on the phone with a magistrate, and then the magistrate would interview you, applying the criteria of the law to see if you qualified for an emergency protection order. So they wanted to know how effective their new law was, so they asked us to do research. So all of these phone calls were recorded, audio recorded, so we randomly selected a whole bunch of them, had them transcribed, and we did a line-by-line -line analysis. We provided a report to the government, which was then used as a basis for retraining their magistrates. So this is an example. There was some lovely practice and some highly problematic practice, but this is an example of an indigenous woman calling in from a remote community, talking to an educated white person uh, who's a justice of the peace or a magistrate. So over and above a, the issue of interpersonal violence, it, it is a really important colonial moment, if I can put it that way. So the woman, uh, the, the court, sorry, the magistrate, the woman has been talking about this man being uh, uh, violent in a sexualized way. The court says, okay, and right from the start he's been aggressive and sexually abusive. And the applicant, who's the woman, says, no, he was okay until August, and then one night we started to kiss, and then I wasn't, and I didn't want to, and then he didn't listen, and then he, and she, trails off her voice as she's describing him raping her. Her voice fades. The court then says, okay, was that reported to police? No, she says. And then the court says, no, now, was that, that was, was that then the first time that you two had relations, had sex? And then she says, tragically, that was the first time I've ever had sex. So what has happened is a powerful, educated white person has told an indig indigenous woman that rape is sex. She didn't say it. The educated expert did. And our analysis of court documents reveals that same pattern over and over and over again. Um, a number of years ago, we did some research that shows the extent to which judges use mutual language to describe violent actions is a better predictor of the sentence given to the perpetrator than is the severity of the crimes. So I'm not talking about political correctness. I'm talking about accuracy that makes a difference concrete difference in the cases. Imagine, hey? So how many people do you know would tell you, yeah, the first time I had sex it was rape, or the, the first my first sexual experiences were abusive? So if we're confusing sex and violence, we're setting people up to be confused. So of course that's partly what people struggle with, right? How could I have sex with my priest at when I was 10? Well, you didn't have sex with your priest when you were 10. Your, t your priest raped you. That's not sex. But if we allow it to be constructed as sex, we're adding a whole layer of confusion, uh, which I think is particularly challenging for children. Isn't that odd? You know, you can look at that, uh, kind of me at the internet, and, and then you can kind of go, oh, that's kind of funny. And then you can go, that's kind of, that's kind of really disturbing in the context, eh? So consent. Your consent law is the same as Canadian consent law, which is the same as most consent laws, which is if you're 15 and younger, you cannot consent to sex. There are a couple of, of exceptions to that depending uh, that are different in different countries based on age. But basically what it means is if you're 15 and younger, you cannot consent to sex. Oh, by the way, I'm happy to make these slides available to all of you. So if you want to, that, that, that's, that's just absolutely fine. So, so that means that children cannot be said to be engaged in sex because they cannot consent. Is that logic sound? <coughs> okay. Children cannot be said to be engaged in sex and adults cannot be said to be engaged in sex with children because children cannot consent. Therefore, it is literally, morally, and legally impossible for children to be engaged in sex. Therefore, there should be no references in your legal materials at any point to children being engaged in sex. Is that logic not sound? Okay. This is the Wikipedia definition of sex tourism. We're not gonna take Wikipedia as the final answer, but what we're gonna find out is some interesting overlaps between Wikipedia and criminal codes. So um, 
in, uh, sex tourism, travel to engage in sexual activity with prostitutes, et cetera, et cetera, affecting a commercial sexual relationship. Sex tourism can refer to a variety of commercial sexual activities, agencies, and academics sometimes distinguished between adult sex tourism, child sex tourism, and female sex tourism. Sex tourism. Attractions for sex tourists can include reduced costs for services in the destination country, along with either legal prostitution or indifferent law enforcement and access to child prostitution, not to mention whale watching tours. I mean, it reads like a, a tourist brochure, doesn't it? Uh, and of course, there can never be child sex tourism because children can never be involved in sex. So you see, it's a profound distortion. Violence against children is equated with sex between adults. This is a Canadian criminal code. Uh, we have a section called, you know, sexual interference. Every person who for a sexual purpose, uh, directly or indirectly, et cetera, towards children, they call it sexual interference. Well, in hockey, that's a penalty. Interference is a penalty. Inter interference, does that denote a crime? Sexual interference? Really? I mean, how about sexualized violence? Or, you know, we have a lot of other language that would be more accurate. And we have a category here called invitation to sexual touching. So you, you're a school teacher and you take a child into the janitor's closet and you grab their body and you force them to grab your body. And in Canada, we call that invitation to sexual touching. Invitation, really. <laughs> Nothing to do with, like for dinner or what? What are we talking about here? Nothing to do with an invitation. It's predatory entrapment. Nothing to do with sex. And it's not touching. It's grabbing of body parts. So what we have in our criminal code is a profound distortion of the crimes in question. And what that means is that the prosecutors and the judges have to use language that distorts the actions because they have to use the criminal code language. And that's the same in Australia, as I'll show you. Australian Law Reform Commission. Um, recently, uh, this, these are, of course, as you know, folks that look after the law and uh, try to you know, make sure that law reforms are socially just and up to date. So it's an important body. Procuring or grooming a child for unlawful sexual activity. Again, children cannot be engaged in unlawful sexual activity or any sexual activity whatsoever. So you have the people who are running the law commission confused about the distinction between sex and violence. Who does that benefit? Does it benefit children? Does it benefit perpetrators? Yes. That's collusion. That's creating a social context that enables and indeed encourages violence. According to criminal law in Australia, the age of consent refers to the age a person is considered to be capable of legally giving informed consent to sexual acts with another person when an adult engages in sexual behavior with someone below the age of consent. There you go. So, the things I'm showing you, they're, you know, they're not rare, they're not difficult to find, you don't have to look for it, but really where you need to look is the most qualified, most expert, most powerful literature. That's where the problem is most brazenly represented uh, and not even reflected upon critically. This is an international human rights organization for children. Child prostitution designates the use of children for sexual activities in exchange for remuneration. These children work on the streets. So okay, you're, you're made to stand on a street corner because you're regularly raped by an adult and you're told your parents will be killed if you're not there and you have nowhere else to go. And then you're, an adult drives along and they rape you and they don't pay you, they pay a pimp and we're calling that children working. And this is an international human rights organization, organization fighting for the rights of children who confuses sex and violence. The United Kingdom Sexual Offenses Act, a recent, this is a recent revision, 2003, sort of recent. They've invented new categories called child prostitution, sex trafficking, and sex tourism, none of which can exist in principle. These are literally, there can never be child prostitution. Children don't have sex to sell. There can never be sex tourism. There can never be sex tra trafficking, again, is a minimizing term. You can traffic in cocaine. That's not the same thing as serially raping and violating people in order to let other people serially rape and violate them. Trafficking is a minimizing term. And sex tourism. And so they talk about these things, you know, the penetration must be sexual. So I come over to your house for dinner, and when you're not looking, 
I shove my dick into the mouth of your child, your eight-year-old child, you're going to tell me that's sexual, right? That's sexual penetration? I don't think so. I think every one of you in this room would understand why that's wrong. Wouldn't you? Immediately. So, how come it's in our criminal codes and how come we're not talking about it? What's up with that? I mean, who's going to do that? If, if, if not the people in this room, if not child protection people, who's going to do that? It's interesting, you know, there's a men's behavior change program in Ballarat and Gales here and Chrissy's here who are from that area. And I know that one of the things that they do is um, they give men problematic language examples from newspapers and they talk with men about the connection between sex and violence. And then they give men examples and the men in the men's behavior change program do critical analysis of the connection between violence and language. And they get outraged about how language is used to make violence, make violence disappear. I think that's fantastic, don't you? Because uh, men who commit violence are not stupid people, generally, you know what I mean? They can engage in this kind of critical analysis, and I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a useful, interesting activity that they enjoy. Am I right, Gil? Yeah. Russia. <laughs> so, Article 134, where's my, the person keeping time, I'm sorry. Well, I've forgotten your name, I'm sorry. Hannah, you're good. Hannah, yeah. am I okay for time? Yeah. Okay. I can remember that. My little one is Hannah. Um, Article 134, sexual intercourse and other actions of a sexual character with a person who has not reached the age of 16 years. And they, they, outlaw sexual, oh, they outlaw sexual intercourse committed by a person who has reached the age, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's about sexual intercourse, which can never occur with children. Washington State in the USA, rape of a child in the second degree. A person is guilty of rape of a child when the person has sexual intercourse. That can never occur. New Zealand, several sections of the New Zealand Crimes Act deal with sexualized violence against minors. Meeting a young person following sexual grooming. What on earth does that mean? Meeting a young person. That's not like predatory entrapment, right? That's like we're meeting up for coffee? Yeah. After grooming. Grooming is an affectionate thing that primates do with each other. Right? It's a minimizing term. People don't groom. It's predatory entrapment. Let's call it what it is. It's not grooming. A very problematic language. And then they call it sexual conduct with a child under 12. And then everyone who has sexual connection with a child. Sexual connection. Really? What does that mean? Is that what it, that's what's involved when you're shoving your penis into the body of a child. It's a sexual connection. Now this is a case from Australia, Arokun, um, which I think is a particularly interesting and telling kind of case. Many of you will be familiar with the circumstances, but uh, between May and June 2006, nine indigenous men, 13 to 25, repeatedly raped a 10-year-old girl. Uh, the case drew international publicity because none of the offenders was sentenced to an immediate prison term. The Court of Appeal said the sentences were inadequate and imprisoned the three adult offenders for six years. The juvenile offenders received various sentences. In a 2008 speech at the National Indigenous Legal Conference, the Honorable Jeffrey Eames discussed the sentencing issues arising from the case. Mr. Eames refers to the crimes as rape some of the time, but also as sexual intercourse, for example. And this is a quote from his um, speech, which I downloaded and copied and, you know, looked at very carefully. Some of the offenders acted in company. Now, what does that mean? Acted in company, in company is a military term. It refers to soldiers coordinating activities together. You know, it's a very positive term. Here we're talking about gang rape. Okay. Some of the offenders acted in company and some offenders acted alone. Some offenders raped the girl more than once. In all but one case, the girl did not object to intercourse. Okay, so you have a senior judge talking about a nine-year-old indigenous girl in this way. How's a nine-year-old girl accosted by 10 older males supposed to object exactly? What's she supposed to do? And of course, no sexual activity took place. It was purely violent rape. And she initiated the sexual activity on some occasions. So again, a child cannot initiate sexual activity. So now who's to blame? 
nine-year-old girl. And then it says uh, later on, many of the offenders when questioned said they could see nothing wrong in having sexual intercourse. <coughs> it's not surprising that people on the street will talk about rape as sexual intercourse when that is in our criminal code. It's a little bit, more than a little bit hypocritical to take someone aside as an individual and say they don't understand violence and they're not talking accurately about their crimes and they need to take responsibility when we have provided them the discourse to avoid their responsibility. That, that's on us. It's a little bit precious to take every individual male into a room and chastise them uh, for doing that. And then there are a lot of children in this community who think the same way about sexual matters, said a probation officer. Again, not sexual matters nothing to do with sex. This is an example from Wales. I happen to be walking down the street in Wales, visiting my wife Kathy's family. <laughs> so this is an affliction, right? Once you start looking closely at language, you just can't stop. Um, I don't recommend it. I know you guys are probably critical in that way as well, but sir, you can't not see stuff anymore. And it's a little bit upsetting. You know, you have to drink a lot to avoid it. <laughs> Anyway, a headmistress had sex with people in uniform while he played truant. So the facts of the case were this woman who was the headmistress of a school uh, took a 12-year-old boy out of his classroom regularly, took him to her office and made him sit in the office, lied to other teachers and said that he had skipped out from school, then went into her office and raped the boy. This happened over a long period of time. So, and then it's presented in the paper, headmistress had sex with people in uniform while he played truant. So that's obviously an affront to the boy, and it's an affront to the family, and it's an affront to dignity, is it not? That the case would be described in that manner. Colm O'Gorman uh, wrote a beautiful book. He's the Irishman who started an organization in, in Britain called One in Four, which is a fantastically uh, successful and important organization about uh, working for uh, survivors of uh, sexualized abuse. Uh, by the way, we call it sexualized violence. It's not a perfect term, or sexualized assault. Right? Sexual assault is an oxymoron, right? If it's sexual, it's mutual and consensual. If it's an assault, it's unilateral and violent. You put the two terms together, they don't work. It's like delicious Vegemite. <laughs> Shouldn't. <laughs> the two terms do not belong in the same, you know, adjacent to one another. Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. So we say sexualized violence to denote it's violence done in a sexualized way. It's not sex done in a violent way. So that distinction is important. That language isn't perfect, but it at least makes, helps to keep the distinction in front of us. So Colmo Gorman, in describing when he was raped by a priest, said, I, I felt so betrayed by my own body, which reacted to what was happening. I was sickened that I could become aroused and experience sexual pleasure at the same time as feeling terrified and disgusted. So here you have, you know, a 13, 14 year old Irish youth feeling that he's more attracted to males than to females, living in a context at that time of utter homophobia, wondering what on earth he's gonna do, and then he's repeatedly raped by a priest. So how does a child begin to talk about that experience? You know, what are the language tools that we give them? Boys and men are already hypersexualized. There's virtually no public discourse about male erections other than a sexual discourse. Men are talked about as hydraulic machines, right? You, titil you titillate buddy, he's gonna get a hard on, he's gotta go off, he's gotta ejaculate somewhere. You know, men who are violent to women are talked about that way. We, talk, we call that the, high, the ejaculation theory of male psychology. You get him angry, boom, he's gotta explode. It's all explosion and hydraulic metaphors. Massively offensive to half the human race. Uh, men, men simply don't operate that way. But what vocabulary, does a, what vocabulary does a boy have to talk about this intense sort of pleasurable physical feeling except a sexual vocabulary? Men get erections for all kinds of reasons. Sex is only one of them. But we have this kind of very restricted, limited vocabulary for talking about this. So children begin to construct their experience in a language of sexuality. That's where we come in, right? To help them construct and make sense of that experience in a different way. John Swales, a Canadian boy who um, wrote about being uh, repeatedly raped by his priest, said when you have sex with your priest at age 10, it's pretty weird. So what's happening is that children are talking these ways, right? They're talking about violence to sex all the time. And when we do that, we create the conditions in which they can be confused and continue to struggle with their sexuality. <coughs> 
Women in court, my first sexual experiences were rape. I'm, I'm sure that many of you in this room have had many conversations with people who have said that to you. There's a CB, uh, CTV news program of prostitution in Winnipeg, Canada. I'm just trying to show how this kind of comes down into the concrete realities of people's lives, right? How do people talk about these experiences? Uh, the journalist was talking to, being interviewed by a very well-known um, media person, uh, an, a news anchor, you know, one of those kind of respected dudes. Um, this problem is a lot younger these days. Child prostitutes are on many street corners. And then um, the, the interview a woman who, uh, who her face is obscured and she's talking about prostitute and the question is being a prostitute. The question was, how did you get started in this work? Interesting phrasing of the question, eh? How did you get started? It's kind of like, well, when I was eight or nine years old, I thought when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. You know, and so I went to school and I did training. You know what I mean? So how do you continue to breathe when a man shoves his dick so far down your throat you can't breathe? I went to a training program on that. You know, it's kind of like the question sort of, it, it's shockingly ignorant the way it's phrased. And then the woman, well, um, I was 12 years old and my, my neighbor took me into the back room of his house and bent me over a table and did me from behind. Then he, then he threw, I should say, threw 50 bucks at me and that was my first sexual experience and that's when it started. So, that a sexual experience? And that's in our national public media. No analysis whatsoever of the fact that there can never be child prostitutes. So we have this notion promulgated at a very broad level. Um, I happen to be reading a book from some people in Canberra, <laughs> Prostitution Narratives, which is very interesting because um, Carolyn Norma and Melinda Tankard Rice, some of you will, will be familiar with this, I guess. Um, but when you, when you look at the first person accounts of prostituted women in particular, they make it very clear that prostitution has nothing to do with sex. You know, there's a woman in uh, Sweden, Hannah Olsen, who started interviewing prostituted women, young prostituted women, um, in the 1970s. She became a very important part of what's now called the Nordic model, or the Swedish model, uh, responding to prostitution. And uh, she asked those women, uh, what is prostitution? What do you do? And the woman, women said things like, prostitution, that's when a man pays you to masturbate in your body. Mas prostitution, that's like internal dirt. I have to wash myself 100 times a day, even today, 20 years later. So they don't talk in a mutual, erotic, sexual, intimate vocabulary. They talk in the opposite vocabulary. Johns talk about it as sex. Prostitutes talk about it as violence. The vocabularies are clearly very different. Now, there are exceptions to that. I don't want to totalize and say that all people who've been involved in prostitution talk that way. But certainly the, the groups of women that Hannah Olson was talking about, and certainly the women today in this book, uh, and another book by Kat Banyard uh, called Pimp State, which really takes apart the whole sex work, neoliberal, yeah, you're just another sex worker. You know, you've got all the rights of, uh, of other people in, your, in our society. You're just a worker. It's for your economic gain, and it's all good. We're going to protect you, right? So you're, you're just another free economic agent selling the ability of someone to rape and exploit you. So we have this neoliberal sex work discourse uh, that also contains the same confusions. So... Um, Back to the, I couldn't help with the stars and stripes, um, given what's going on in North America now, uh, you know, in the United States. I live right next door, so, you know. <laughs> so, you know, so maybe, maybe you guys would like to repeat after me. Uh, we'll take this pledge, are you ready? Uh, war is peace, slavery is freedom, ignorance is strength, violence is sex, child rape is sex, tourism, Trafficking is sex work. Wife assault is a domestic dispute. Colonization is settlement. Sexual abuse is a sexual connection. Molesting a child is invitation to sexual touching. Hey, okay? let's all sign on for that. What do you say? Not so much. Yeah. So, in closing, I'm going to show you a couple of what I think are really good uses of language. These are uh, scenarios. Um, Hannah, am I? Yeah, you're good. I'm good. Yeah, 30 minutes. What are you talking about? I've got 30 minutes. That's impossible. 
So, okay, good, thank you. So, um, I always talk too long. I'm really confused by why I have time. <laughs> Maybe talking too quickly. We heard that as we gave Pardon? Time. Thank you very much. It's jet lag. It's kind of, yeah. It's not me being disorganized. So, okay, so women in the Yukon territory. I do a lot of work in the Yukon of Canada. And, you know, I think Australians get big distances and small populations, right? So the Yukon is an area the size of France with 35,000 people. You know, you want to have a coffee with your friend, you have to drive four hours in a truck, basically. Like, it's like that. Uh, a lot of indigenous folks there. And um, they had a real problem with uh, several cases, um, police cases. Um, and uh, so we ended up doing a two-year project with police organized by the Women's Coalition and by the Indigenous Women's Coalition in the Yukon. We met with the entire command structure of police in the Yukon for two years, four days every two months. And we said that we would meet with them only if the entire command structure were all in the room every day, no exceptions, blackberries turned off. Right? And they agreed. And uh, two years later, I mean, at the very beginning, I couldn't get one of the police officers to have a cup of coffee with me and make eye contact. We couldn't even shoot the shit about hockey, right? And that's, that's bad in Canada, right? <laughs> you can't talk about hockey, that's bad news. No one's gonna talk about, about hockey with you. So they were terrified about being humiliated, which of course was not our plan. But um, a lot of stuff had gone down. Now, um, there are indigenous women in Canada who are on the police review commission they are involved in doing the annual um, review of employment for police officers. They're involved in doing training of police. And now what happens in the Yukon is if there's serious crimes, crimes uh, particularly against women, the superintendent of the police will call the women's coalition representatives and say, okay, how are we gonna talk about this in public? So they have a collaboration. That was unthinkable not very long ago. And now we have police officers challenging the sexualizing of violence against children and training other police officers about how to interview without using a sexual vocabulary, which I think is fantastic. Um, so there's a, a group of women, the Women's Coalition, that made some public service announcements, and these were read over the radio by um, you know, young women, 16, 17 years old. So I'll just read them to you, because to me they're beautiful. They're, they, to me they're an example of how in a, in a rape prevention campaign, you can honor the ongoing resistance of victims in the way that you do the anti-rape campaign and get away from all the mutualizing and the sexualizing of the crimes. I asked you to stop. I tried to negotiate. I screamed for help. I turned my face away from yours. I crossed my legs. I stuck out my stomach. I clutched a tree. Then I went limp to avoid the pain and went to a safe place in my head. Do you really question my resistance? The judge decided I consented. Nobody asks to be raped. Stand with us for dignity and nonviolence. That's not bad, eh? Pretty clear? Another example. He rapes me at home. I go home as late as I can. I try to never be alone at home. I try to always bring a friend. I work as many night shifts as I can, hoping he'll be asleep when I get home. When all else fails, I get drunk, hoping I'll pass out. That's how I attempt to stop it. Do you really question my resistance? The judge decided I consented. Stand with us, or sorry, nobody asks to be raped. Stand with us for dignity and nonviolence. In what conditions is a person more likely to choose violence? With all due respect, I think the question, what causes violence, is the wrong question. Violent behavior is not the effect of a cause. <coughs> It's a chosen course of action in a context. A better question is, in what social context is a person more likely to choose violence? And in what social context is a person less likely to choose violence? Where unilateral acts are confused with mutual acts, where assault is a conflict or a dispute or an abusive relationship, and where violence is sex, people are more likely to be able to choose to do violent acts because we conceal them for what they are. Um, we have a conference on what's called response-based practice coming up in Perth in 2017, in May. 
called Dignity. So if anyone's interested in uh, learning more about that, I can send you more information. That concludes the capitalist portion of the... Uh, <laughs> actually, none of us make any money. Um, but we do have a kind of a dignity party. Um, and so um, I'll stop there. And I'll just ask if you guys have any thoughts or questions or comments, insults, accusations, <laughs> anything at all would be good. Yeah, both hopeful, um, but also really points out the contradiction, doesn't it? That these crimes can still be called or talked about in sexual terms uh, somehow when they're against children. Yeah, yeah. So you wonder um, how that occurs. Um, we see a, great, a really wide variety of language used uh, in legal judgments. Um, the same judge might powerfully, really poignantly uh, criticize a violent act and then in the same sentence, or the next sentence, talk about it as a sexual activity between two people. And so I think what that reflects possibly is the effort of the judge to really kind of address the crime, but I, but I, don't, think that they, I don't think that they get the distinction between mutual and unilateral actions. In fact, I know that they don't because I talk to a lot of judges and prosecutors. And in fact, when you talk to judges, often they'll say things like, well, we can't talk about it as uh, forced vaginal penetration because, you know, we're supposed to, we have the presumption of innocence and uh, we're supposed to be neutral and objective. So they think calling forced vaginal penetration sex is neutral and objective. <laughs> Whereas our argument would be that forced vaginal penetration is, is exactly what you're prosecuting. Or vaginal penetration with a penis is what you're prosecuting, whether or not it's forced or consensual is what the court decides. So they're so far kind of removed from an accurate physical descriptive vocabulary that they're still thinking that to talk about it in more physical descriptive terms is bias. And of course it has nothing to do with presumption of innocence. Um, that's not an ex explanation for not talking that way. Also, what I think is reflected here is that because we use this language in the criminal code, <coughs> the prosecutors who uh, prosecute these cases and the judges have to use a certain amount of that language. And they can't be criticized for that. That's the criminal code. But what's characteristic of cases is that there's typically a lot more gratuitous use of that language that is not required by the criminal code. So you might be forced to call it, for example, in Canada, invitation to sexual touching. But you're not stopped from saying the man repeatedly forced his penis into the child's body. You're not stopped from saying that. The criminal code doesn't stop you, but they don't say it. So we have, I think we have a lot of uh, training to do. It's very important to recognize that lawyers who become judges get virtually no training whatsoever in understanding interpersonal violence. None. Doesn't happen in law school. Neither do medical doctors, by the way. So we have, we have a kind of a large scale structural issue that gets reflected in the individual cases in different ways. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can you point to legislation in any country that does this reasonably well, that gets the language uh, you know, right from the perspective that you're talking? And are there any examples in law schools where they are attempting to really address this issue 
I think the initiatives that I, that, that could be, there, there could be a, a lot going on that I'm certainly not aware of, but I can tell you about a couple of initiatives that I think are really interesting in Sweden. Um, there was recently um, uh, a letter sent to the Swedish parliament, actually last week, um, demanding that the Swedish state undertake a formal commission of inquiry to discover why successive Swedish parliaments have not enacted laws to protect children from the porn industry coming into their, their computers. Because the average age at which uh, I know the research about boys, the average age at which boys are able to access extremely violent images of typically men attacking women and children is 11. If we construe the porn industry as a sex industry, we're much more likely to see it as normal sexual development. If we construe it as a violent industry, then, it, then we can more clearly see our responsibility to stem the influx of that information. I think that's very hopeful that that's happening. There was also a letter published in the large, largest Swedish newspaper recently talking about the fact that um, the so-called pornography industry is, is an industry that is, nothing, is about nothing more than violence, full stop, and requiring the Swedish state to recognize that formally in law. So there are initiatives, but I don't, I don't see them. Uh, and there are uh, feminist law initiatives in different law schools. In Canada, the feminist law groups ten, are tending to be sort of um, they're kind of falling by the wayside a little bit. So I'm not aware of so many uh, initiatives from within the legal profession itself. I can say that in Canada, in family law, um, which is an area that we're involved in, we do independent analysis of um, psychological and psychiatric reports in family law cases where there's been violence. I can say now there's more room for people to intervene and challenge expert reports. Because we know, for example, that reports like um, based on the MMPI, the MCMI, the PAI, produce false positive diagnoses of women who are battered. Um, personality disorders in particular, so women, women are having their children removed on the basis of false diagnoses uh, on a rather broad scale. So we're now seeing more efforts to redress that uh, and have a broader scope of opinion brought in in family law cases where there's violence. Uh, I can use a big voice, but I'll just have a catch your eye. <coughs> Thanks, Alan. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, and, uh, and respect to you. Um, I, I was, I was kind of thinking, and um, uh, in response to your last question, you know, we, we use sexualized language in these uh, in these instances. Is it part of it's part, almost like a coyness about not saying the actual thing that took place in explicit, mm -hmm. straightforward kind of language? Yeah. And, and I wonder if that kind of feeds into this notion, you know, we talk about sexual predators, sexual monsters, and that sort of thing. It kind of helps us to put people in a category of something crazy about them, you know, something we just can't understand because we've got this, yeah. rather than, it's just, a, it's an act of mm -hmm. sexual, it's an act of violence, it's a yeah. of, you know, of exploitation of power of one, one person over another. Yeah, yeah, there, I mean, certainly, um you know, some people will say, um, so, for example, some judges and prosecutors will say, and, and by the way, I'm not picking on them. I mean, they're, um, will say things like, um, yeah, it's hard to talk about these things. We, we live in a kind of a prudish society, right? It, it, it's just hard to be very explicit about these kinds of things. And of course, there are contexts in which you don't want to be too open and direct. You know, I've sat beside parents in a courtroom um, while, while the person who repeatedly raped their eight-year-old son was being prosecuted. And they did not need to hear that this man had repeatedly forced his penis in and out of the anus of their son. They didn't need to hear that language. Do you know what I mean? There was reason to be sensitive in that particular case. But in a courtroom and in the criminal code, we actually promised to tell the truth. And if we're not going to tell the truth, then we should have a sign over the courtroom that says, we're well, actually politeness is more important here. You know, we're actually not going to use accurate language. We should have a, you know, we should have a rider on the criminal code. We're not using accurate language here because we'd rather not because it's disturbing. So I, I don't really think that there's a reason for it or an excuse or a justification for it, which makes it all the more interesting uh, in that particular case. And then I think what happens is we wrongly categorize people. 
Getting to your second point? Yes. Um, because what we're calling sex offending is violent offending. Yes. And then we accuse people of having disturbed, you know, sexual kind of drives, yes. when in fact their actions are uniformly violent, they're not sexual in nature. So why are we inferring a sexual drive when the action is violent? We get involved in making false inferences about psychology because we get into false descriptions of the actions. Yes. And that doesn't lead us to understanding people. I think that leads us to distorting. And we can consign people into a particular category. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, just apropos <coughs> of that, thank you. Um, it just reminds me of the point, like in working with a lot of uh, people who've committed violence, in my, in my particular practice, it happens to be mostly men. Um, you know, um, and talking to them about social responses. And as we all know, a lot of those men have had horrible experiences of violence as children, uh, and as young men, and as adults. You know, you talk to a lot of men in Canada who are in the mining or the oil industry, and they go to remote camps, right? And there's a lot of violence happens uh, in those places for a lot of men. That's very difficult for them to deal with. But anyway, so, you know, uh, you get talking with a man about, yeah, so, when they were younger, yeah, my dad used to do this and he used to beat up my mom and this and that. Who knew about that? You know, did anybody know about that? Well, I remember I told my teacher once about it. What did your teacher say? Well, she didn't really say anything. Did anything change? No, nothing changed. So my experience is that it has been, and I can't say this as a sort of a, this is not a definitive statement, but my experience has been that a lot of men who are involved in committing violence have not only experienced violence when they were youngsters, could be violence by one parent against another or against them, but they have also experienced a complete lack of appropriate social responses to it. You know what I'm saying? So, so for many people, it's the lack of social responses, actually, that is the most egregious part of the crime. You know, as one woman um, told me how, um, well, one man, just to stick with an example from a male, told me who, whose father had been molesting him. He told me that he told a social worker uh, who, unbeknownst to him, was friends with their family. And so he never talked about that again for, you know, he told, and then he got a licking, and he never talked about it for 30 years. And that's what happens. People know that if you tell someone and it doesn't go well, if your life gets worse when you disclose, not better, people become highly unlikely ever to disclose again. If I was to ask all of you in this room, you know, um, what percentage of the people that you work for, if you were to ask them, when you disclose the violence against yourself or that you experienced, when you disclose that to an authority, did your life get better or worse? How many people are going to tell you their life got better? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? So we want people to come forward and tell us, and yet a majority of people will not tell you their life got better. So there's, something's missing, right? Part of it is the way we make meaning of it. Um, in um, a lot of areas of corrective services, one of the things we tend to do is to split men off into treatment programs right. for violent offenders and for sexual offenders. Right. Could you make a comment on your thoughts about that? Uh, I think what gets called sexualized, sexual offending um, is a very particular form of violence, and separate kinds of precautions are necessary, uh, depending on the severity, um, in part because of the nature of the victimization, um, and certain forms of social justice, I think, are necessary in those cases. So I, I think that there is a rationale for doing that. Um, there are different forms of violence, uh, but I think there's also room for, for people who are involved in those programs to be seen together. Uh, and for the problem of so-called sexual offending to be m more treated as an example of violent offending. So, but I do think there is a structural difference, and there are forms of safety and sentencing patterns that we have to be mindful of. There is also, um, I mean, I've been paying really careful attention to Donna Chung's work, who is the Australian uh, academic, that, uh, as you know, and um, I, I think it's very interesting to I found this as well, there's kind of a group of men, or there's some men who are just, they're not, when they're allocated by court to attend a program, for example, or CU, they're just not willing. And um, for different reasons. And so I've had the experience of doing groups, and somebody's in the group, you know, and he's just completely doesn't want to be there. 
making a mess of it for everybody else. So I think there is room for a different kind of response to some of those men, I think, which would be much more of a surveillance response than a treatment response, so to speak. So what would, it, for example, this is how it could work, I think. Um, a lot of the safety planning, the pressure for safety planning, is on the shoulder of the victim, right? So someone's violated, and then say child protection gets involved, and they say, okay, now we're gonna do safety planning. Why is the victim responsible for doing the safety planning? Why do we not, for example, why wouldn't, uh, in a first court appearance, why wouldn't a judge say, okay, uh, Mr. So-and-so, you're accused of committing a violent crime. Um, there are corrections officers over here who can engage you in uh, making a concrete plan for the ongoing safety of the people you are accused of violating. You're not required to participate in that, but that, that is available to you. And then when the victim comes forward later and says, well, I, I want to alter the violence restraining order. <coughs> I want to alter the conditions. Now the judge will have some criteria because judges don't have criteria, right? They struggle, they don't know when to alter the conditions and when not to because they don't have proper criteria for doing so. So then the judge can say, well, I did offer the safety planning process to your partner. Uh, he declined to attend that process. I, I don't think we'll be altering the violence restraining order. So then you, have, then you have a process where you have a voluntary process. And so if you have a person who comes in then and uh, says, well, I'm here to do the safety planning, they volunteered to go there. Now you can work with that person. And if there are people who don't want to go there and are being obstreperous, you can fire them. You can say, I'm sorry, this doesn't work. You, you know, you obviously don't want to be involved in this process. I'm not doing this process with you. If you'd like to do this process, come back when you're ready to treat me with some respect. I, I think that's, that there needs to be another way so that we're spending our treatment dollars our program dollars on people who are opting into treatment, not people who are reluctantly complying. I recognize that many people are reluctantly complying in the beginning and part of our <coughs> skill is in engaging them in a meaningful way, but there is a group of people who are just reluctantly complying to avoid responsibility. I'm getting the three minute sign now. Hannah, you're all over it, thank you. I hope that's a, at least a partially useful answer to your question. So thank you very much, Al. That was thank you. fantastic. And as a token of our appreciation, just have a small gift for you. Thanks, thanks for the very brief introduction. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.